So, what does a bowling ball, a question mark, oatmeal, a wrench, uh, ties, <laughs> a candle, and a heart have to do with our show today. And specifically, what do all of these things have to do with making school a wonderful place that your kid actually wants to go every day? So hang with me because we'll be talking about each and every one of these and how helpful they can be. And now if I can find a space for them. <laughs> so before we get into this wonderful content, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm Charmaine Tanner. I'm a retired teacher. I loved teaching in Woodland Park, Colorado. I also am a parent. My son receives special ed services throughout his schooling, inclusive education services. And I'm also the author of a number one best-selling book on Amazon called The Art of Advocacy, A Parent's Guide to a Collaborative IEP Process. And I am passionate about helping parents like you become even more effective advocates for your children because we want our kids to be happy, safe, and learning every day in school, right? So this is what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about seven different ways that we can help schools be that inviting um, wonderful, active place that your child actually gets up excited about going to school in the morning. So I would love to have you say hi so that I know that you're here. Also, if you want to type in where you're from, because it's always neat to see the different connections that we have. But let's look at this here, because I think sometimes this might be how some kids are at school, right? Do you think your child's ever had one of these moments? Or how about this is like, yay, <laughs> the excitement that we want to see, right? I'm not sure <laughs> I want to see those type of clothing. <laughs> but what we're going to be doing is talking about how to make things really different. And I've come up with seven specific things that we can do to make school a place where your child actually wants to be. So when this, you might not realize, but it's actually a fourth video in a series that we've been doing about universal design for learning and multiple intelligences. So if you would love to have links from our previous videos, just type hashtag links in the comments below, and hopefully we will get you all set up there and you will get the links to the shows. And you know what I should do right here just for a moment? is stop sharing and see if I can go over and multitask because I think I'm a little, I might not be able to do that right now. But there, there were three previous videos that we did. The first one was having a seat in general education isn't enough. The second video in our series was how to break down learning barriers using universal design for learning. And in that video, we talked about specifically math and how to help different kids with different types of intelligences to learn math skills. And then the third video that we did was great minds learn and think differently. And in that video, we talked mainly about the subject of reading and looking at the multiple intelligences and how, depending on what your child's strength is, how we can use that for them to excel with their reading. So just type in hashtag links in the comment comments and after the show, I will give you the links to each one of those videos. So how about that? So our first one is tell students why. So this is when we would be um, 
using our question mark <laughs> because I think it's not only true for students, but also for us as adults, right? We want to know why something is happening, why it's important, why we should be doing this, how this is going to help us in our lifetime, right? And kids are the same way. So encourage those questions and be able to explain to the students, be able to explain to your child why we are doing this. And, you know, I think back to like high school <laughs> when I was trying to learn algebra and I was having like a really, really hard time. And I remember asking my dad, like, why do I need to learn this? It's like, when am I going to ever use this? And of course, there are many real life examples of when you use algebra. But I remember what my dad said was, you know, one of the main things is this is just helping you learn your thinking skills. Um, and so sometimes we need to help kids learn that what we're teaching at school or, you know, in a home situation is it really is helping them develop those problem solving skills or those thinking skills that can be like super important, right? Um, so asking or um, responding and being able to tell why we're learning things is really important. The other thing I want you to remember is we want to hook things to kids' prior experiences. Um, and the more that we can relate the stories that we use or the, you know, the science experiments or whatever and relate them somehow to the students' previous experiences, what they're interested in, that will give them that hook too to be excited about what you're teaching. We want them to learn why all of this <laughs> subject that we're talking about is important. We want to make it relevant to individual students. And to me, the, I don't know, like the, the best ways and the best days I remember of my teaching days were when we had integrated thematic learning. Um, and that's kind of teacherese for <laughs> what it means is we take reading and math and science and writing and social studies and all the different subjects and we teach those, but we only use this integrated theme to teach it. So let me give you an example. Um, when I was an elementary teacher, one of the things that we did in our grade level was had a whale museum each year. And so this was like so much fun. <laughs> what we did is, like I said, we integrated all the subjects around the topic of whales. So we had to do things in math, like figure out how many gallons of milk a day did a blue whale calf drink nurse from its mother. And I think if I remember right, it's like about 150 gallons of milk a day. So what we did is we had kids bring in, cleaned out because otherwise they really smell, <laughs> plastic gallon jugs, empty gallon jugs from milk. And we collected 150 of them <laughs> to show everybody this is how much a blue whale calf drinks every single day. So those kinds of things are not your typical math lesson, but there are a ton of ways that you can bring in math when you're studying the topic of whales. Um, so in science, we talked about how the blubber of a whale keeps them warm even in the cold ocean waters. And we had a student come up with this great demonstration of that where they used um, gallon-sized Ziploc baggies and put, I think, almost like a whole can of like Crisco shortening in there. And um, that was simulating the blubber. And then they had another plastic bag that they put around it. We had a tub of cold ice water. Kids would put their hands on the outside of the bag so they didn't get the Crisco shortening, but they would dip it into the freezing cold water and see how that blubber protected their hand and they didn't feel the cold. 
Um, you can talk about geography with migration of the whales, right? You can talk about the different kinds of whales. You know, what are baleen whales and, and how can they be the biggest <laughs> whales but eat the tiniest little things? So what we would do after we studied, and of course we read whale books and all of this, but um, as a culminating activity, what we did is we had a whale museum. And we, we were in second grade, we invited the first graders to come through the museum. We invited other grades that wanted to sign up for a tour. The parents came one evening, but each student was responsible for um, inventing, developing, making a museum exhibit that would be interactive and had something to do with the topic of whales. So it was just like so fun. The art teacher helped us and we transformed the room with blue sheets from Goodwill and um, jellies that were hanging down from the ceiling. So we wanted to make it almost this atmosphere of you're walking inside the ocean when you came to the whale museum. So we tied in art. And it was just like so fun to see the kids got to choose the interactive exhibit that they wanted to make. They were super excited about doing this. The students that came through the museum on a tour, they loved it because it was hands-on, interactive. So, you know, in one corner we had a big, you know, several fishing nets that, that held up the 150 gallons of milk we had. Um, the person there with their blubber Ziploc baggies and their ice cold water. We had, you know, students that had recorded reading a whale book, and then they had different felt figures and things for the students to, you know, kind of reenact the story. We even brought in, thank you to Susie Graff, and if Susie Graff is watching this, she even brought in her rowboat. <laughs> And we fit a giant, a regular sized rowboat into my classroom. And what we did is we had the kids sit in the rowboat and we projected the Reading Rainbow um, video of going on a whale watch. So the kids got to do that. Another activity we did for math was to use adding machine tape and go into the gym and measure how long you know, a orca whale is compared to a humpback whale. And we had those strips of adding machine tape around the room so students could see how big the whales were. But the, the whole idea is that um, we used a theme and we allowed for some individual choices. We connected it to some of the experiences that kids had had in the past, and we made it an exciting time for, um, for learners. So like I said, if you are here with us live, I want to make sure that we are showing up live on my phone. I do see us say, hey, so Erica's here with us. Hey, Erica and Lissa and Terry. Yes, Terry's from Denver. Um, Lissa's from Ohio. Idaho, I was going to say, Ohio, no, <laughs> Liz is from Idaho, and Eric is from Idaho, so welcome. So our first thing that we just talked about was the question mark. We want to tell kids why they are learning things, and that will help them get more motivated, and it's like, oh, there's really a reason why I want to be doing this. So let's go back to our screen here and look at... So for each one of these steps, I don't want you just to think, well, that's a great story, Charmaine, but like, how do I use this? I want you as a parent to think about writing some of these as accommodations in your child's IEP. So I think it's really important for everybody to have an accommodation that says, connect the new learning to the student's prior knowledge. So that could be your action step, is you make sure that you have an accommodation in your child's IEP that talks about connecting what they're learning to previous experiences that they've had. And that is like 
super important. So let's go on to number two, which is called the Goldilocks level of challenge. <laughs> so this is why we have this little bag of oatmeal. <laughs> this goes with number two, the Goldilocks level of challenge. And you might be able to guess, right? If you can guess why I call it the Goldilocks level of challenge, type it in the comments and we shall see what ideas you guys come up with. So I'm going to give you a couple seconds because we're usually about an eight or nine second delay, but how do you think oatmeal and Goldilocks <laughs> are connected to helping your kids be motivated and engaged learners at school? Let's see if we have any brave people that are going to share their ideas. So when I look at Goldilocks um, and I think about what we give students to do either for homework or for classwork, I want to make sure it's not too hard, not too easy, but just right. So what I'm talking about is depending on the situation, if we have our child in a reading group, we want them to be working on some of their IEP goals, right, during that reading group. And there are ways that if the other students are reading on a higher level, we can modify things so the reading is still just right for your child, but they're still making progress on their IEP goals. Or how about when they get homework home? And we'll talk about that as an accommodation in a couple minutes here. But Goldilocks level of challenge, I think, is something that um, we want to keep, keep in mind. Um, and Lissa says, yes, not too advanced or easy. Exactly. And you know what I've seen some um, parents talk about is that you know, their kids have had the same skills over and over. And to me, that shows that the kid is probably bored or, you know, it's like way too easy and they're tired of doing that kind of work. Um, so it doesn't always have to be that the work is too hard and that's why your child is struggling. It might be because the work is too easy and they're tired of that. They're not going to be motivated and feel happy and excited about coming to school when it's like, oh, I've got to do that same old stuff every day. So, um, yeah, and Terry says, this is where I love Shelley's planning, right, to give students easy access to the material and choices around how much challenge they want to take on. Exactly. Yes, that's an excellent point, Terry. Um, because our kids can rise to that occasion and they can have input into, you know, this is what we're going to be learning about and what, at what level, at, you know, how much depth do you want to go into this? So let's look at some other things that have to do with this level of challenge. So there's this whole um, notion of instructional and independent levels. And instructional is when you have a teacher with you and she's working on skills that are just a little bit maybe above where you can do something independently. And she wants to push you and help you learn those new things. Versus when you're doing seat work or when you're doing homework, hopefully that's at more of an independent level. That's where you're practicing those skills that somebody has already taught you. Um, there's also the frustration level, and we don't want kids to go there where it's like totally, I have no idea what you're talking about, and I'm going to rip this math paper up because it is like way too stressful. The other part that comes in when we look at challenges and making sure we're at the right level for our kids is that they need specific feedback. So not just like, oh, good job, great, I love that, thank you. But we want to say, look at how you figured out three different ways to solve that math problem. How awesome is that? 
we want to make sure that there's enough positive opportunities in our kids' day. Because we know when our kids are successful, that leads to engagement and they will be excited about going to that class and learning new things. But how about as a parent? How are you going to use this? Oops, here I forgot I had this slide in here. So when I'm talking about modifying things for reading groups, <clears throat> this is an example of an adaptive book. And I'll put this actual URL in the, the description so you can, you know, have it as a hyperlink to to click on. But I did want to mention, you know, when we're looking at different levels and say the whole class is reading the book, The Call of the Wild, and it's like, well, wow, this is going to be at my kid's frustration level. They don't know how to read this book. So that's where we want to modify. That's where we want to use adaptive books that are the same story, but on written on a much easier reading level for your child. Um, and that's a way that we can make kids, <clears throat> we can have kids be included in general ed classes and adapt what materials they're using, but they're still all together discussing the same book, The Call of the Wild. So that's just one example. As a parent, the action that I want you to take is look again at accommodations. And type in the comment box if your child usually brings home homework. I know different schools have different policies. Some schools are like, you know, um, our kids have worked hard enough during the day. We don't send home homework, just read 20 minutes a night. Other schools are like, no, you know, these are, you know, skills that are important. We're going to, you know, make sure kids do all of this homework. Um, so type in the comments if your kids are usually assigned homework. Because if they are, what I think is important is in the accommodation section of the IEP, you want to say that homework will be at an independent level. You don't want to have to be trying to figure out how to reteach these math concepts. Um, you don't want to have to be looking up this science vocabulary. You want your child to be more independent when they're doing their homework. Sure, you can be there for prompting or giving that specific feedback, but it shouldn't be something that is like so totally frustrating that your child has no idea how to do it. Um, and kind of going along with what um, Terry had said as far as kids having the choice of where they want to be in that challenge, some teachers I know are doing where they'll send home a packet of homework either on Friday or Monday and it's due sometime during the, that week. By the end of the week, the students have to complete all of this homework in the packet. Um, and hopefully it's at their independent level and they're not frustrated, right? But that is kind of nice because it gives some flexibility to kids. And then there are students where it's like, that is like way too open-ended and they need more of a structure like Monday night, we're gonna do this with your spelling. Tuesday night, we're gonna do this with your math. I mean, so you have to know your child and it has to be individualized, but sometimes having, you know, like you need to cover this in five days at home and you get to pick what you work on first, just by the end of the week, turn this stuff in. So that could be another option when we're looking at level of challenge um, and having the kids be able to kind of be in charge of that. So we've done telling kids why, we've done the Goldilocks level of challenge. So number three is choices. We want to give kids choices. And that's why, <laughs> you know, if you go to your closet and you want to pick out a tie for the day, is it you're going to pick out this cute artistic tie made by kids? or in our house for Steeler fans, <laughs> maybe you want to wear your Steeler tie, or do you want to wear this delicious money tie? <laughs> and you have choices, right? And we want to make sure that kids have more choices at school because that, again, is going to help them stay engaged. So 
Um, my vote is to wear the money tie every day. I like. I told my husband last night, you should wear that money tie. <laughs> um, and some teachers are wonderful about figuring out how to make choices alive during all different times of the day. So this is an example of a bulletin board, and it says, what do you do when you're done? And the teacher has different ideas for the kids to choose from. So she's got some, you know, logical puzzles, math flashcards, those would really appeal to those logical mathematical thinkers. She's got word work, which would go with the linguistic learners, the writing activities, another, you know, reading activity with um, high frequency words. But the idea is you don't just say when kids are done doing their work, well, Go get a book to read because maybe that's not like their choice. <laughs> they don't like reading books that much, but they would love to be able to go back and do a Sudoku or, you know, put, a, you know, a puzzle together or something like that. So the more choices we can give kids, the more they're going to be engaged. And so as parents and as teachers, we want to, you know, honor and value the ideas and the options that kids come up with. Um, I always thought that kids in my classroom gave much better ideas than I could ever come up with. So I loved having daily class meetings and we talked about different topics. Sometimes it was about, you know, how we're going to um, get along on the playground. Other times it was like, you know, what else can we have at the math center that you guys would think would be exciting? So asking for your child's ideas and honoring those is really important. Of course, with that choice, sometimes we need to give kids more time for processing. It's not like, do you want to do A, B, or C? Quickly tell me what it is. I mean, some students need that time to think about, oh, this is one choice, oh, this is another, so just be respectful of that. Um, we showed an example of a bulletin board that can be a choice board. You can also have that, um, you know, made as like a worksheet and it's, you know, these are the things that you have to accomplish this week, like a bingo sheet and cross out the ones, you know, that you've completed. See if you can get a vertical bingo this week with your, <laughs> with your things that you need to do. Um, and then the other important part, I think, about kids being engaged and happy at school is to make sure that they know that what they do makes a difference. Um, so we want to, you know, like celebrate those choices that they make. We also want them to walk away at the end of the day knowing that they made a wonderful difference by being at school and in their classroom that day. So this is a fun video and I'll post the link in the comments, but you know, when we look at choices, it's like in tapping into their strengths. One of the things are videos, and there's like a ton of fun videos that kids can be learning from. I won't um, see this or like zoom on it right now, but um, I will put the link in. And Terry, and Amanda's here from Virginia. Hey, Amanda. And Terry says, we chose a Montessori school partly because we didn't want to um, fight homework battles. Yeah. So that's the thing. It's like, you know, the philosophy of the school makes a huge difference. And Lissa says that her son has in the past, but I think had homework, but not so much for the last two years. Even when he was mainstream last year, he didn't have homework. So that can be, you know, a blessing, right? <laughs> not to have that to do at night. So giving choices, one of the things that you can think about is if you asked your child to make a list of all the things they wish they could spend time learning, what do you think they would write down? So take a minute and think, what do you think your child would love to learn 
that they're not currently learning at school? And give us a couple ideas. So here's a community person. It looks like they might have either a community garden at their school or maybe someplace in the city. Um, yeah, Erica says art because her son Jeremiah is like such a talented artist and sometimes that gets kind of pushed to the side and kids don't have as much time to develop those artistic endeavors. And I mean, there's so many ways that you can tie art in. And I used to do class books a lot with my younger um, first and second graders. And we all wrote, you know, different, you know, sentences that would go with the book. We had different kids that loved drawing and they would be our chief illustrators for our class book. So there are ways, I mean, in math, when you do word problems, you can draw a picture to go with the word problem and that helps kids figure it out more. So you don't necessarily have to think about art as going to an art class, but how can you incorporate that at home? How can the classroom teacher incorporate that during the day? This is says birds and wildlife. Cool. And think about like if you did a whole, you know, thematic unit on that, all the different things you could do, the migration pass for um, geography, you know, you could, you know, classify for a math activity, the different kinds of birds, the sizes, the weights. I mean, go outside and take photos of birds that you see. Um, be able to just kind of saturate all the different things that you can think about for that topic. And Terry says, lately my boy has been learning everything he can about World War II airplanes at home. So how cool is that? And, you know, I mean, it would be so cool for him, you know, to maybe do a Google search and see if he could find some World War II pilots that are still alive that he could interview or find ones that he can find previous interviews that they did. Um, you know, the designs that they put on the planes were so cool. You know, maybe he could, you know, design what his own plane would look like and what his, I don't know exactly what they call it, but like kind of like their nickname or their call number or whatever would be. Um, Lissa says that her son is obsessed with birds. He's already learned a lot on his own. So yeah, see, and to me, that is something that we need to share with staff because it's like, look at as an independent project, all the things that he has looked up about birds that he has learned because he's so intent on learning more about that topic. So let's bring birds into the curriculum and how can we have them, you know, the other thing I think um, when we look about the importance of kids knowing how they're important and how they're contributing is like it would be so cool for your son to maybe, you know, go to a different classroom and um, you know, maybe go to a different building to down to elementary school or whatever and share different things that he's learned about birds or read a bird story to the kids or, you know, so it's like kind of shine the light on their expertise. Um, when you're, you know, when science fair time is coming around, what's something that they're passionate about? What do they get a pick um, that they want to do? So Terry says the local Air and Space Museum produces videos about planes and sometimes interviews former pilots. Um, we watch them together. Oh, how cool. Oh, how fun. Yeah. Alyssa says that she, her son lets everyone know. <laughs> and yeah, so that's okay. And I mean, and then he becomes this expert in that field. And it's like, look at the neat things that he knows instead of, you know, looking at, oh, you know, but he needs help with this or help with that. But it's like, no, look at how he zeroed in here and he learned so much. So 
that I think is just like crucial. And sometimes if they can't get that at school to allow them to explore that topic at home. So here's your action step. An idea for an accommodation could be choices for writing topics are given. So many times um, teachers give a prompt and kids have to fill you know, out the paper and write a story about that prompt like, you know, last weekend I, and then they have to write a story about what they did last weekend. Instead, if we can have teachers give students more choices, or this is also for like research topics. I know I was helping one mom and um, her, you know, child was assigned this research topic and it was what everybody else had to do in the class. And, you know, the idea was to learn, you know, research skills. But I mean, you can learn those skills on, you know, by having a topic that you want to research versus everybody's going to do this one topic. So. Again, look at the IEP, look at how you can embed some of these ideas that we're talking about today in the IEP. So it's not just like, well, that was fun to learn about, but no, we want you to actually then start applying it to your kids' um, IEP. And if you weren't with us at the beginning, I mentioned that this is a fourth video in a series. If you want to get the links for the other three videos, just type um, hashtags, links in the comments, and you'll get the link for having a seat in a general ed classroom isn't enough, how to break down learning barriers, great minds learn and think differently. Um, so let's continue on our merry way. <laughs> The fourth thing that we want to do is to encourage collaboration. So this is, um, you know, I was thinking like um, sports teams, you know, so it's not just collaboration in the classroom, but being on a team. And I couldn't find a football or a different ball, but I did find this miniature bowling ball <laughs> that my grandkids use. So it's to symbolize collaboration, being on a team, working with others. Now, if your child has a lot of that um, interpersonal intelligence, they love working in small groups. Not all kids do, but I still think it's important for us to find ways, even if it's just with one partner, for our kids to do things with others, at least part of the day. And that doesn't you know, mean that every day, all day, they have to be in this group. But those are skills that can be really important in life, and we want to encourage that at school. So to me, when we look at being on a team or being included in a classroom, it's that sense of connection with others that that sometimes is the motivation. We want to be with our friends. We want to be with our teammates and trying to, you know, win the game or have fun on the Saturday in the ball field or whatever. But one of the things that we can look at in the classroom is that all our groups don't have to be everybody on the same performance level gets in the same group. We want to have flexible groupings. We want to have mixed levels of kids because they learn from each other. And I want other students to know, yes, you know, maybe your child has an IEP, but look at what he can bring and what he can offer to the group. Um, and if you look at collaboration and another aspect of it, it's having peers learn how to mediate and how to resolve things. Um, I know a lot of different schools will have um, peer, you know, aides or peer mentors. They also will have some kids that are trained to be like peer mentors on the playground to help, you know, resolve different conflict that comes up during recess time. So that can be another aspect of collaboration. The other thing is doing simple things like um, think, pair, share. <laughs> so what that is, is you give students a time to think about a question, then they pair up with a friend, 
and they share their ideas with each other. So again, if your child doesn't like working with maybe small groups, but would be okay with collaborating with one friend, that would be a great way to do it. Or during literacy time, it could be that all the students are writing on a topic of their choice. They pair up with a friend and they share their writing with each other. And they can help critique it or, you know, talk about what was the most interesting part or things like that. So that collaboration, that sense of belonging is something that will help your child be engaged and motivated at school. So here's a team building activity. And I think it was it's kind of meant to be like one of those icebreakers, maybe at workshops, but it also works really well in the classroom. And it's called the Three Musketeers, a team building activity. So one, you find, so you have a group. So like a group, you know, a lot of teachers have like the desks and groups or kids working at tables. So if you don't have those natural groups, you can, you know, make <laughs> groups for this activity. And everybody in the group, you have to find three things that everyone in your group likes. Then find three things that everyone in your group doesn't like. The third step is to find one thing that is unique to each of the team members. Decide on a team name that has something to do with your collective likes and dislikes. Write your team name on your table tent, which would be kind of like a, a, a label thing. So this would be fun. And throughout the year, you can form different groups and different teams. And this, you know, this could be used as a get to know you um, activity in the beginning of the year or just throughout the year and kids notice that what they have in common with each other and also what makes each of them different. So there's like so many neat things that you could do with the three musketeers. <laughs> so in the comments, right, does your child you know, do they gravitate toward a club or a group or um, you know, are they on a sports team with other kids? Let me know in the comments. And, you know, hopefully there's a variety of choices at your child's school or through like Park and Rec, things like that in your community. So Terry says, this is where my boy struggles. Um, and yeah, I think it's that, um, so I think what Terry's talking about is the collaboration time. Like sometimes I think that her um, grandson doesn't feel that comfortable. And so Terry, I know, you know, that you're working with other people outside of the school too. So I wonder if they've given you any good ideas about, um, you know, making sure that he does have that connection with some of the kids. I know in the community you've talked about um, at the pool, it seems like he's made some friends there. Um, so, yeah. And Erica, you know, she's saying, I wish. And Lissa's saying, no, not anymore. And that's, I don't know. Um, that's something as a parent that you can think about too, because um, if your child has an IEP, one of the things, if they wanna participate in extracurricular activities that are school sponsored, they can get um, supports for that, whatever that looks like, um, and that can be written in the IEP. So, you know, generally we think about IEP goals as academic or maybe speech or OT or whatever. But if your child wants to participate in school sponsored activities after school, like clubs or, you know, intramural teams, things like that, and they need some additional support, and that could be just accommodations, that could be, you know, the coach having 
a visual schedule up of what their practice time looks like or, you know, simple things like that. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you have to have an, a pair, of, you know, go with your child to the club. Some kids need that support. So whatever support your child would need to participate in extracurricular activities at the school, write that into the IEPE. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and it's, I think that's a challenge too for parents that are homeschooling or have their kids on online education is, you know, how are we going to get that sense of community? And so that's where um, looking at park and rec activities, um, things in your community at your library. I mean, libraries these days have like so many things besides like story time. Um, that that would be something to check out in your community too. Oh, let's carry on. Here you go. <laughs> so when we're looking at collaboration, one of the action steps that you can take is looking at the IEP goals. I have um, quite a few parents that will ask me about, you know, how do I get my child included? And they're, they're not participating in any kind of core subjects in their classroom. So one of the suggestions I make is that your children um, have IEP goals that include the phrase, with typical peers in general education classrooms, or the, in general ed classroom if they're in elementary school. So by putting this phrase in there, that they're going to be working on their reading skills, but it's going to be with typical peers in the general ed classroom. Um, so this will be a way that your child can have that sense of belonging in the classroom to encourage that he's going to be or she's going to be working in groups of other typical kids and learning from them and he or she is going to be shining and sharing what his gifts are with his classmates too. So that's our collaboration. So our fifth um, way that your kid can be happy at school. <laughs> is to nurture those teacher-student relationships. So that's where our heart comes in. <laughs> um, and as a teacher and as a parent, I know the difference it can make when our teachers really get to know our kids as people. Um, not reading through a file, not looking at samples of work, but really get to know them as a kid and what they love to do on the weekend and do they have pets that they love and what do they do with their brothers and sisters and all of those things. The more your teacher can be connected to your child as a person, the more that that can help your child feel engaged and motivated to be at school because there's people that know him, there are people that like him, and there are people that want him to be there. So that is like super important. And I think so many times we look at, um, you know, we look at, I don't know, like there's got to be some, you know, you know, long method of figuring things out in order to make a difference, but there's been a lot of studies that have shown that just having the teacher say good morning to your child and use their name makes a huge difference in how the day goes. And that's, it's kind of surprising, but it does. It's like recognizing them as a person. And so that can be that important part of making sure our kids have that sense of belonging, that somebody does care about, you know, that social and their emotional side and making sure they feel safe and comfortable. Um, and the next one is you'll see a variety of, you know, ratios. I like to use the five to one. So, you know, when as a parent, you know, you need to kind of <laughs> say something like, wow, <laughs> you want to make sure that you balance that out by having at least five different positive things that you say to your child too. So 
as a parent, this can be challenging. And also as a teacher who has, you know, 20 some kids in their class, it can be challenging. But as much as we can throughout the day, we want to give that specific positive feedback. Um, we want them to hear at least five times more positive things about themselves during the day. And that makes a huge difference. Like if I wake up and I know I'm going to a place where people really care about me, where they know me as a person, where they're going to always be looking for those positive things about my personality, I want to go to that place. I would like to go to that school. The other thing is to include humor, um, look at, again, their interests that they have, and make sure that you're um, building on that. So think of a teacher you loved having, and what was it about them? So I want you to type in the comments, you know, from elementary, middle, high school, college, whatever. Think about a teacher that you've had in the past that you just loved. It was like, ooh, I want to be in this person's class forever. What was it about that teacher that made you feel that way? So type it in the comments. And let's have some interaction, right? <laughs> I can think about one teacher that I had that um, was actually a professor in college, <laughs> and I loved the sense of humor that she brought to the class. And it was like, oh, we don't have to be all serious all the time. Um, you know, and I, I remember my sixth grade social studies teacher and the stories that he would tell about history and the events that happened, and it wasn't just this dry on this date this happened, but he always managed to bring in stories. And I just, it was, you know, you could just be like, feel like you were, you know, <laughs> back in the day when he was describing it. So how about you? What kinds of teachers do you remember that were just like wonderful connections for you? Hey, Sarah. She says, my favorite teacher believed in me. They knew what I was capable of before I even did. So how neat is that, Sarah? My favorite teachers believed in me. They knew what I was capable of before I even did. Yes, to presume that confidence, to know that you can reach these high expectations, right? That makes us feel good. Um, so type in more examples that you guys can think of. I know when my son Dylan was in high school, there was a teacher that said, oh, you know, you don't have to take the test. Now, most kids, you would think, would say, whoa, <laughs> I love this teacher. Then <laughs> they don't make me take the test. But you know what? Dylan came home and said, the teacher doesn't think I'm good enough. And it was like, wow. So that was not one of Dylan's favorite teachers. You know, and the teacher had good intentions to give him a pass on the test. But Dylan saw that as, you don't think I'm good enough. You don't think I can really do this. So Terry shares, she says, I had a couple of teachers who helped me to overcome discomfort in their class. Cool. So what did they do in order to do that, Terry? I'd be curious. So yeah, give us likes and loves if this is resonating with you. Um, what did the teachers do, Terry, that helped you overcome that discomfort? Because maybe some of the things that they did, maybe those would help your grandson. Maybe those would give ideas for other parents that are either watching live or on the replay. Um, 
so yes and i wanted to share if you are watching the replay make sure you still participate and type in the comments because i come back and i look at the responses and if there's questions i try to answer those um, share ideas with you so um, i love when you're participating and it's not me just doing all the all the talking <laughs> So your action step for this fifth way we can make sure kids are happy at school is to look at positive behavior supports. And your child doesn't necessarily have to have a formal behavior plan, but in the accommodations, or if they do have a formal behavior support plan, look at ways that they can, you know, if it's gonna be a positive thing, for your child to have lunch with the teacher, just one-on-one. -on -one. Um, that could be a way to nurture that relationship. And it's like a wonderful way for the teacher to get to know your child, for your child to get to know little inside things about your teacher, like do they have a dog or a cat that they adore? What does your teacher like to do on the weekend? And it's like, oh, I love to go fishing there too. And, you know, so we just want to build those connections. Um, and so instead of looking at tangible rewards sometimes and behavior support plans, like, you know, you'll get a new matchbox car if you get this many points. Instead, there can be things like lunch with the art teacher, lunch with the principal, you know, use the adults in the building that maybe your child would like to develop a relationship with and use that as some incentive for your child. So six is where our candle comes in. <laughs> And it's find out what makes your child glow. And I do have a number six. I wonder why I have a six. <laughs> it's in the tens place. Um, and it's burnt a little bit down here. So we've used the six for a number of years for <laughs> my birthday cakes and my husband's birthday cakes. But I want you to think about what ignites your child. What gives that beam, that smile, that enthusiasm. And you know that as a parent, relay that to the teachers. Don't keep it a secret. That will help the teachers to tap into like, oh, I forgot you love birds. Oh, let's talk about this. Look at this. And, you know, it's like, no, oh, yeah, World War II planes. Ooh, can you tell us some things about that? You know, so I know some teachers have had like an expert time during the week. You know, and when our kids are younger, it's kind of like the star student of the week. And as our kids get older, it can be the expert of the week. And they get to share a topic that they're passionate about. And that just lets them shine. Um, and so that could be something that you propose to the teacher is like, are there some times that different kids can share their interests and what they love doing um, and make this part of, you know, the weekly class routine? But let's see. Sarah says, um, I love that idea about lunch with the teacher. I worry that the excuse for not doing it would be showing favor to certain students. But that's a perfect excuse. Apply it in the inclusive way and offer it to all students. Exactly, Sarah. And that could be a cool thing to do. I mean, um, you know, you go through and you, you know, draw a name out of the hat and that's the person that gets to eat lunch with the teacher on Friday. Um, and I love the point that Sarah brought up because we don't want these ideas only to be oh, this child, you know, is on an IEP, we've got to figure out certain extra special things. All of these ideas are things that work with all kids, and we want all students to be excited and learning at school and do it through ways that kind of incorporate their strengths and their interests, right? So either glow sticks or candles, but make sure we find ways to have your child shine and glow. And 
part of this comes with um, having kids be excited to learn for the sake of learning. And that's like Lissa's example of her son, like he dove into that topic of birds and he wanted to learn and was excited because he was interested. Or um, Z and Terry's situation where he was talking about, I want to learn more about World War II fighter planes. So look at that that love of learning just because they're interested in that. We want to ignite that. Having kids set their own goals, either at school or at home, can be something that really is helpful. And being specific, but recognizing the effort that kids are putting it, putting into different projects that they're working on and how far they've come. I know some teachers will use graphs for students to graph, you know, how many math problems they got right on that one minute test, you know, yesterday and how many they got right today or, you know, correct spelling words or science vocabulary and have the student graph their own progress so they can see the progress that they're making and not just like, you know, oh, the, the teacher, you know, figures out what grade I have, but have the student be more involved in that. And also, when the kids are included and when they're in general ed classrooms, they see other kids making that effort to learn and to do and to try and to persevere, and they learn that that makes a huge difference in their life, right? So what is something your child would love to learn more about? So maybe not the birds or the World War II fighter planes, but do you have any inkling? It would be fun to know. Type in the comments, what do you think would be something else that your child would be so excited about knowing? Um, and Terry says that Z loves to share humorous poetry and jokes. And yeah, see, so then he's, you know, that's shining the light on um, that neat skill that he has. Um, Terry says curriculum compacting has helped him. And so, yeah, so, you know, you don't have to learn as much detail about each thing. And sometimes you can show what you already know and you can go further versus having to do all the specific things. Um, Alyssa says, he also set off the fire alarm with his magnet at school. <laughs> so you never know when things are going to happen, right? <laughs> she says, my son loves bringing um, things from home to school as a learning tool, like he brought home a magnet. <laughs> and so that's, I guess, where the fire alarm got set off. So yeah, you just never know, right? <laughs> What's going to happen there? So we shall continue on. One of the ways you can incorporate this into the IEP is to look at the present levels section of the IEP. Make sure your child's strengths and interests are written in the IEP. <laughs> you know, we talk about these as parents and sometimes people at the table are nodding their heads and saying, thank you for sharing, but it doesn't ever get written in the IEP. I want it embedded in the IEP. I want other teachers to be able to go back and say, oh, Oh yeah, we talked about how she was so interested in this. I got to make sure I remember that. Um, so have strengths and interests actually written in the IEP. And our last one, and I should do a little, I have this new little gadget here, if I can see which one it is. <laughs> Number seven is support. And so that's why my wrench is here. All right, this might not be a wrench, it might be something else, I don't know. But we wanna make sure that your child is getting the support that they need. And again, this is kind of like we could do Goldilocks here too, that um, we want the level of support that is not too much where the child is really dependent on somebody else always repeating directions. We don't want it too little that your child is like 
floundering and nobody's there to help. We want the level of support to be just right. And we want to look at support in a variety of ways. So let's look at some of these. Sensory supports. I don't know how many times I hear teachers talking about sensory needs and you know, when the child has had a meltdown, then they're like, well, then I, you know, I was asking them if they wanted to go walk around the track. And what we want people to know is the support that kids need around sensory needs is often a preventative type of thing. We don't want to wait till the meltdown has happened. Um, so we want to be proactive with that. Also having those positive behavior supports in place, brain breaks, and this is not just for the child with the disability, but all the kids in the class can use brain breaks. And also self-checking materials, that helps reduce that anxiety. If your child feels um, unsafe, if they feel unsure of themselves, it's really going to be hard for them to be engaged in their day. So if you have younger kids, you might have heard about Go Noodle, <laughs> which is a great um, website that you can go to. They have fun brain breaks. Again, it's usually a whole class activity that you do. They have calming exercises if your child wants to do more of a quiet, you know, like kind of get my thoughts together here and get ready to get back into the classroom. Um, so Go Noodle is a website that you might want to explore. But as far as a parent and taking action, one of the things that I recommend, if your child uses fidgets at school as um, a way to help them with their sensory regulation, is have an accommodation in the IEP. Sensory figure fidgets in the student's desk for him to choose when he needs them. Because so many times I see in IEPs, um, sensory fidgets might be listed, but they're like in a basket in the special ed room. And it's like, no, <laughs> we need those in the classroom where the child is. Or teachers say, well, he didn't ask for them, so you know, we just left them on the counter. We want them accessible. So, you know, depending on your child, you know, maybe having them in the desk is not going to be the right way to go. But the idea is you want something specific in the accommodations that talks about how your child's going to be able to use them. And you want to prevent that, oh, the basket of fidgets are in the special ed room. They need to be also available for all the students. Um, you know, when I bought new things for kids, I would buy enough for the class because it's not just probably your son or daughter that would love to have something to fidget with, but it might be somebody else. And you want to, again, have that available for everybody. So your take action steps, remember, are to tell them why. Make sure you connect the learning to prior knowledge. Do that Goldilocks level of challenge where things are just right. The third thing you want to remember is to give students choices. Encourage collaboration. Nurture that teacher-student relationship. Find out what makes your child glow and provide the right amount of support. So again, if you want those three previous videos, just type in hashtag links, and you will get the links to um, each one of our previous videos about this topic. So I want to thank you for being here. We kind of had a longer show today, but um, I appreciate you spending your time and interacting with this. And Lissa says, yes, sensory supports are a lifeline for him. Yeah, exactly. And we got to make sure that they're always available, Lissa, and not, you know, not some adult deciding, oh, maybe you need your sensory tool now. Um, we want the kids making that decision, right? 
So I hope this has given you some ideas that you can share with your child's teachers, ideas that you can use at home, because the main thing is we want our kids to be excited about learning new things. We want our teachers to know the strengths and the gifts and what our kids can contribute to um, the classroom and to the school community. So next week, I have a wonderful show. We have a guest, um, Nicole Eriks. She's going to be coming on and talking about her new book that's coming out about modifying classroom curriculum. So April 5th, that will be our show. But I'm Charmaine Tanner. I'm here to help you become an even better advocate for your child. Um, if you would like to join our membership group we have at the top of my Facebook page is a link for that. But I enjoy being with you. I enjoy learning with you because I don't have all the ideas. I love when um, you are also offering your ideas. So thanks for being here and we shall see you next Thursday. Bye-bye.